Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining my deep dive. Today we have with us the illustrious Suzanne Reimstein, who is one of the most beautiful people inside and out. She has the most refined sensibility. Um, and we're going to talk today about restraint and how that can lend an elegant approach to uh, decorating, interior de decorating, and probably life in general. Um, so welcome, Suzanne. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you. I was delighted to be asked to do this with you, Dara. Well, thank you. And you're joining us from Los Angeles. I am. And looks like your beautiful living room. Is the that library. There? Library. Okay. And then that has been my spot for the last year and a half. <laughs> it looks like a beautiful spot. Does it overlook it your garden? Yes, it does. It overlooks the garden and it's often piled high with uh, books in disarray and piles of paper, but we made it nice for company. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. My house has turned into like a, uh, it's a cyclone. I have so much stuff everywhere and I'm a paper person. Um, I think a lot of creative people are. And so I, I like paper. Like I have, I think if you're in it, or not everybody, I guess, but I think if you're in a creative field, you like the palpability of the touch. I do. And I like some notes to be larger with boxes around. Them. <laughs> I have to mute for a second because I have a ambulances. I'm on 6th Avenue and 31st Street in our corporate offices. So I apologize for the background noise. So anyway, I wanted to leave this casual instead of doing like a bio or whatever. I thought maybe you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, your background, when you decided you wanted to become an interior designer. Yeah. Um, and how you got your start and how you became one of the great stars of American design. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, uh, it, part of it was the era in which I grew up. I'm old. I, <laughs> I, uh, I was born and, and uh, grew up in that wonderful optimistic time of post-war America. And uh, it seems that most of the mothers stayed home. And uh, we lived in this wonderful uh, late Victorian house uh, that had been lived in by a, 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 a man and his then known as spinster sisters. <laughs> and they all left at about the time, you know, we were coming in. So it was great. And I, I and it seems that, uh, and then my grandmother lived two doors down who is just, could grow anything, you know, and always had beautiful flowers and things in her house. And in between us lived Jerry Bremerman. Do you know Jerry? Oh, of course, that's amazing. The, the grand dame of, of decorating. And she was a huge influence on me. Uh, exposure. And, and wow. Holden, her daughter. I mean, we played all the time and we, we it was from the era when you jumped rope and played Simon Says and all those wonderful, nostalgic, dorky games. But uh, anyway, it's so it was a time when people really cared about their houses and were and and uh, the rationing was coming off. So into this kind of gloomy old house, my mother, I mean, all the woodwork was dark, uh, you know, with kind of crocodiling on the surface because it had been uh what do shellacked. you call it you shellacked yeah, yeah, yeah varnished yeah. i think yeah and um she had it all stripped and pickled in the early 50s oh. which lightened it up enormously and so you know they were all she and daddy were always doing projects around mainly she would think of the projects and he would have to do them <laughs> <laughs> you know like uh but then i they were all interested in their gardens too and so i just Grew up with it, I think, in my DNA. And the entertaining wasn't like this elaborate things. It was maybe having people over for an outdoor dinner or, or having people over around Christmas or Thanksgiving. But you always brought in things from your garden and I decorated your house. So I think right. that was just in it. How uh, I was an English literature major and college me too and me too you were you yeah. i think one of the best preparations for life 
especially for COVID. I think all of us liberal arts majors maybe had a little better time of it <laughs> with COVID, I don't know. But uh, so, uh, you know, there was that. And um, I was, my first uh, uh, job was in journalism. I was the managing editor of the Tulane newspaper, The Hullabaloo. Oh, and uh, then I went on from there and I worked for uh, Hotting Carter, uh, the one who got the Pulitzer Prize for his uh, editorials on uh, Manzanar and on other uh, things having to do with racial and social justice. Then I went off to uh, Washington and I worked for Eric Severide at CBS News during the time of the Vietnam War wow. and, uh, and Watergate. And oh, so you had a whole other career prior. To I had a whole other career and that's how I met my husband. And uh, then, you know, kicking and screaming, I married him. I mean, not married him, kicking and screaming, but going <laughs> to Los Angeles. Wow. All of my friends were so condescending about going to Southern California. Oh, they just, it was a fate. We're, uh, if you had to, one of my friends said, if you had to fall in love with somebody from California, why couldn't he have had the good taste to be from San Francisco? I mean, <laughs> seriously. But anyway, I came um, out here and it wasn't too many years later that I would be on one of those winter mornings when the light is slanting and, you know, I would have to thank Fred for being here. But we both came from families that you bought a house and then you stayed in it your whole life. So we bought this wonderful old house that he picked out and then it took forever to kind of recycle the shag rug that was in it and do things. And I got as interested in gardening. And I used to, uh, to me, I don't know, living in a house, decorating a house, having the garden, having your friends over is all one big idea. And uh, I used to volunteer at the Huntington where I learned so much. And uh, I was just right away dug into the garden and I announced to my husband, I didn't want to do documentaries anymore. <laughs> he was very upset. <laughs> he said, finally have a wife who understands what I'm doing and now you want to stay home. And so, anyway, he was happy in the end. And uh, one thing led to another. And uh, I started Hollyhock when Kate was eight and went on to do things. But yeah, I just always been about, interested in it, you know? I just wanted to say for the people who don't know, Hollyhock was your shop. Yes, which I had for 30 years, which I loved. And on its 30th birthday announced it was closing. And I have to say some people cried. So, you know. I'm sure, it was yeah. a marvelous, marvelous shop. Yeah, it, it, it was so fun to have that and to be able to introduce people to things they never thought of using with say more contemporary things. So, uh, you know, we had plexiglass tables that would be good uh, segues back and forth to have the objects talk to each other. But I've always thought that everything I've done prepared me for uh, where I am now because uh, writing an English paper at the college level certainly involves gathering all kinds of information together becoming familiar with it, putting it in a uh, in order that makes sense, mm -hmm. beginning, a middle and end. And that's certainly what a television program is, you know, that's nonfiction. That's how you have to do it. Right. And um, to me, that's the way I decorate too. Interesting. That's so interesting. Okay. I get to know, I get to know the client, what the client wants, and I know that I'm hired to fulfill their wishes, but through my filter, all the traveling I've done, the books I've read, the experience I've had. So, yeah. Marvelous. Okay, that's really interesting. So um, when did you leave the South? Uh, I think it was 
It must have been in around 1979. Okay. Okay. So you haven't lived down there for a long time, but it had to. It's still with me, believe yeah, me. I was going to say, it really had to inform your sensibility. One of the things, you know, when I was the editor of Miranda, I loved um, having that Southern connection because I think Southerners really care about their homes in a way that um, it's different. It's just so thoughtful and it is a lot about, you know, having people over and putting on your, you know, putting your best foot forward and like there's such a deep caring. So what I'm curious about, because I think, you know, the sub, the South is, I mean, in my mind, I think of it as, you know, really embracing proper decorating and you're living in California where the approach is much more laid back. So how do you marry those two things? Well, first of all, the neighborhood in which I live is Windsor Square, which started in about uh, 1905 in a bean field. And uh, so from then until the beginning of the First World War, these houses were built. Like mine is from 1914. So they were built, you know, with dining rooms and libraries and living rooms and things like that. But there is also this connection to the outdoors that you can see in all of these houses. So I think that uh, a lot of people who live here might be third generation. One of my dearest friends is 93 year old, is 93 years old. And she lives in a house that was her grandparents oh, that wow. was moved from downtown to Windsor Square. And she reared her children in it. You know, it still has the same table and chairs that was made for it downtown. So there's that. Then there are a lot of people from the South, a lot from the Midwest. And it's a real neighborhood, I suppose. That's uh -huh. how you could say it. With, uh -huh. with good schools, you can walk to Larchmont, which is the little shopping place. And it's just great. I've lived in this house for 41 years. So that's not the usual California thing. And right. lots of my neighbors have been here right. forever. Yeah. So it's different maybe than what most people um, imagine it. Uh, yes, but nobody yeah. I know, well, yes, no, nobody I know lives in that super formal way. And, uh, but there are lots of dinner parties, but maybe they're just not as uh, the way that we learned when we were first married or something, you know, mm -hmm. they're just different, but they're still lovely. I went to my neighbor's, uh, I think last Sunday night and uh, three of her grandchildren were there, you know, all under the seventh grade and their parents and they, you know, they cleared the table and there were uh, uh, candles on the table and it was all really nice and, Sounds you know, so it, but, you know, there were no butlers or anything. Right. <laughs> Right. Well, not too many people have that anymore, right? Um, so one of the things that I was so struck by when I saw your house in Montecito and Architectural Digest was just how modern it was. Um, and I wasn't expecting that because my first memory of your work was when Peggy Kennedy photographed your house in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, I remember there being very elaborate curtains at the window and a lot of antiques and um, it made me realize how, how versed in many styles you are. So when you're, um, when you're starting into the design process, you touched on it a little bit in terms of, excuse me, channeling your clients and stuff, but where do you generally start? Uh, I start in the classic way. I usually start with the architecture and what do we need to do to tweak it or if we're, what are we doing? Are we doing more of a project? I love to rethink rooms uh, for the way people are really gonna live. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you think about how they'll use the room and- And, and how they really, really are gonna live. I see, I see. You know, I mean, are they more people who need a big library or a big family room more than anything else that is comfortable for a lot of people or just exactly what it is. 
Uh, so I start with the architecture. And then the next thing I do is the, uh, is the uh, layout because, uh, and then I might have a few things in mind already because I kind of know what their style is and how we wanna make the house work for maybe a diminished family or a building family or whatever it is, or multi-generations. And, um, you know, so that's great. And also I probably have a few pieces in mind, either theirs, I call these puzzle houses mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of houses I do, these people have already had a life. They've collected things, they like things, they, mm -hmm. you know, and I wanna use those. So uh, being able to use things people already have is so much more difficult than starting yeah. from scratch, right. but it's important and it's part of who they are. So uh, that's why they're, they're pieces of the puzzle. Right. So how do you do that? I mean, I remember when I moved, I took photos of everything that I had and I, I kind of put them on a board and I rearranged, you know, like I thought about the different rooms and how I might, you know, put different things together. Like, yeah. how do you do that? Is it all in your mind or do you have a process for it? Oh, well, of course, what we, we, you know, sketch things out or we have a board or and sometimes rooms just put themselves together, but then you start moving things or you found one great piece. And I'm well known among my clients and colleagues for sort of having a penchant for <laughs> going <laughs> into uh, uh, either uh, warehouses, you know, with a flashlight where I found some wonderful things are to go to some of the great, what I call the magpie dealers, somebody like uh, Tom Stansbury in uh, Newport Beach, who just has, loves stuff and has a photographic mind and can tell you exactly what this is and that is. And what you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me. So, uh, so then I might've been to one of these places and found something. I, I love to throw in a bit of painted furniture if it's appropriate. Or uh, I also, I would say my favorite period for the kind of the backbones of something is that period from about 1815 to about 1840. Uh, I love that when it was coming a little bit, I love neoclassical, but when it was coming out of that a little bit and it goes into Regency and it gets a little bit of fantasy and then, you know, a couple of exclamation points, maybe a really modern something that just seems to go there or a, uh, uh, maybe a light fixture or something that just perks it or, uh, or even, some bit of wacky Victoriana that'll just make everything else look real. Right, so some surprises and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it sounds fabulous. Um, okay, I'm gonna just, I'm, I wanna get to your picture. So I'm gonna just move on to the next question if you want. So our, our I mean, if you don't mind, our conversation is about restraint. So when I was preparing for our talk, I was, you know, we were thinking about what we wanted to talk about. And the thing that struck me the most was just how nothing is gratuitous in your rooms. It kind of goes to what you were just talking about. Everything is like so thoughtful and um, beautiful. It's like a work, like a like a composition. You know, really a composition. Um, tell us about your principles of editing because I think a lot of what you do is about the editing process. Am I am I right? Well, I think it's more, I see things in shapes. And uh, I was very fortunate to go to uh, a secondary school uh, where I had, I had an art teacher who always made us put things upside down or sideways so that we would see things in shapes and balance. And uh, I think that kind of training but by the way, both my husband and I felt we learned to learn in our secondary schools. I at a day school in New Orleans, the Newman School, which is 
so great academically and he at um, Exeter. And uh, though he went on to Princeton, I went on to Tulane. I, just after secondary school, anything I wanted to learn, I felt that I could. I don't know, does that make sense? Um, yeah, totally. Right. I think some schools teach you to learn, like they teach yeah. you a way of learning, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so anyway. Um, okay, so you have a quote, go Rolex or go Timex. Yes. I'm speaking about the mix of high and low. Can you talk yes. about that philosophy a little bit? Yes, I can. <clears throat> And the house in, uh, in Montecito, I wanted that to be my getaway house. So, uh, but, I, and I wanted it to be really simple. Simple ain't easy. <laughs> the, <coughs> both the inside walls and the outside are integrally colored plaster, all the same color, which I can say not only I, but the fabulous Dick Boris and James Share on my, my uh, fantastic architects at Boris and Sharon. We all absolutely obsessed over this color. We had to look at it in the shade and the light. Da, 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 da. And finally, we got that right. But, you know, uh, so that. That's good. And on the, the, so it's all handmade and it's dead simple, so beautifully proportioned. That was the splurge. I did a lot of uh, vintage uh, buying uh, in the great shops around Santa Barbara. And uh, so many, so many. And uh, uh, so, you know, you, you have to look a little more. And I got a lot of things from Cherish and those other online places that mm -hmm. I think are so good. And so, okay. so that's what I mean by high or low. And then uh, that Rolex or Timex came from a very colorful, uh, legendary man in uh, New Orleans who uh, was showing a group of us his... his uh, wine cellar, which was consisted of the finest champagne in Methuselah's. That's bigger than a Jeroboam. I mean, I don't know, to me, it seems like that. And he drank the finest champagne or our local beer, Dixie beer. And he said, always go Timex or Rolex. Interesting. And it stuck with me because it kind of, uh, it kind of went with what I was already thinking. That's you know, so oh, I will say, in order to be able to pick out these pieces, I think um, I'm old fashioned enough to think that <sighs> history is really important. And not that you have to follow it with any kind of, um, you know, staying within the lines, but I have learned so much from catalogs from Christie's and Sotheby's way back in the day when I was trying to learn about furniture and what are these things called and what's that and then that got me into um, you know uh, neoclassicism and whatever and then of course my love of of, uh, of literature uh, the Susan Sontag book on the volcano lover and we just happened to be in Ischia at the time and you know, all of that, I think, uh, adds to it. Our, uh, I brought our daughter to the Villa Carolos when she was like 11 or something. So my mother bought me, brought me to Vizcaya when she was 12, when I was 12. <laughs> she, but uh, our mother, uh, she didn't believe in going to, uh, you know, Disneyland or anything like that. I don't even know if it existed back then, but she was like, oh, we're in Florida. We're going to Vizcaya. And my brother was like, too, of course, he's an architect, as you may know. Uh, yeah, we're going to Vizcaya. We went to the Fairchild Gardens. And I just remember tromping through gardens forever. So, I mean, I think it's DNA. Right. I don't know what. And right. I just think that you can't learn enough. 
I love the books that people give me. I love, uh, we spent a lot of time when our daughter was little, we would be with her in the summer. And then in the winter, we would have a grown up vacation and we would go to a big European city and do things like have wine with lunch or uh -huh. <laughs> something like that and walk around. We both love walking through big cities, architecture and at night, probably doing something musical, you know, hearing something, whatever. And um, all, all of that, just getting used to seeing different uh, shapes and, and uh, the way that uh, parks are laid out. I care a lot about uh, urban, the urban landscape, mm -hmm. but yeah, so. Um, it sounds like it was yes. a very authentic experience growing up. You know, it was. and authenticity is really important to you. Yeah, you know, there are just so many different types of uh, architecture there from all the fancy wedding cake, you know, manses on St. Charles Avenue, this wonderful, wonderful uh, shotgun houses that, yeah. you know, painted all those colors and, and then just pretty houses. There's so many pretty houses in in yeah. New Orleans. It's such a special place. Yeah. My pr proudest moment was when I took my daughter to Paris. She must have been like nine and she wanted to go to Disneyland or Disney World. I don't know what, what it's called. So we took the train, we went there and we were there for like a half hour and she said, mom, I want to go home or I want to leave. And I was like, yes, <laughs> I taught her something. This is so great. It really was. That is I'm so proud. Um, all right, so um, detail is very important to you. And, it um, is. And what are some of the most, um, what are some of the details that are overlooked most? Well, just for me, and honestly, I do celebrate people who are different from I am. I, I just, uh, this kind of, uh, let's throw everything together and it can clash and have 8,400 different colors. I personally couldn't live in it, but hooray for people who can, you know, I mean, I think it's important to celebrate other ways too. Right. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to say that, that, but for me, what I like are, I won't say that I do wow rooms, but when you come into a room that I do, the longer you're in it, the more I think you're aware that it feels calm and that there are a lot of things to look at and then you can start noticing the details. I always put uh, like a five eighth inch header ever so subtle at the top of my curtains if I'm doing, you know, uh, what do you call them? I don't want to call them formal curtains, but curtains with a palmet are, you know, mm. details. Uh, like the curtains in my bedroom at um, in, uh, Montecito are beautiful thin panels that are just barely sewn and on that, that, that suits that. But in Los Angeles, yeah, I have the header, I have the inside of the curtain is lined with a very uh, nuanced check mm -hmm. that you don't really see, but it's there. I always feel like when you just see all that that white uh, stuff on the other side of curtains, it's Blinding, like seeing, yeah. I don't know, underwear from the 40s or something, <laughs> with white slips or something. Uh -huh. Anyway, I, I like the detail, but it doesn't have to be so contrasty. I mean, it can be, but um, I'm looking out there. I love that. And I love to spend time really thinking about chairs what I'm gonna put around the size of the nail heads, uh, whether I do a micro welt in the fabric or do I do something else? I don't know, I think it's uh, good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think those things really do make a difference. Yeah, I mean, this is this, and I've always felt that good furniture that has some sort of graphic outline, it's great, you could, you could, uh, you know, you could have, a room stuffed full of all these things and you could upholster it in the brightest, most clashy colors, 
and it could be fun. And then maybe your taste could change after travel or whatever. And it would look just as beautiful and, you know, paler colors or interesting things. Then if you really get to it, you could just put, you know, white linen slip cover. So, I mean, if you have good furniture uh, and things that you like because, and you probably only like them because you know about them, it is so worth putting the time into knowing about things, I think, mm -hmm. it's like anything. Yeah, that's, a, that's great. Um, I think that's really uh, wonderful wisdom. All right, so we're gonna launch into your slides. We have so many beautiful rooms to show the audience. So I thought we could start and, and you could just give us a little um, story. Yeah. Tell so this is our apartment in New York, which we've had about uh, 12 or 13 years. And my husband found it, of course. And he always, and he found the house I live in now. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he was really good at that. Of course, he grew up in a wonderful townhouse in New York. Uh, so he kind of knew what to look for. It, my daughter and I had looked, couldn't find anything that was within the parameters. And of course he went out and found it first thing. But this was, the, this was from uh, a 1905 building and uh, everything in our well were uh, duplexes. And during the Second World War, they had become separated. So we had the living floor. And it's wonderful. It was painted kind of a kind of brightish yellow. And all of the, uh, you know, the beams and everything were outlined in a thin-ish line of Kelly green. So <laughs> there are things to overlook. But um, I, I, it had to be really comfortable. And Fred, my my late husband was not interested in, a, in a, a crash pad, which I know a lot of people come to New York and they just want somebody to sleep in there outside all the time. No, he wanted to cook a roast chicken on a Sunday night and have people over for dinner. So uh, it had to be a little different. And um, yeah, and then there were so many ins and outs in this room that, um, I realized I, I wouldn't know where to put the, the art or different things like that. So I uh, commissioned uh, Bob Christian with whom I've done so many things. I think he is amazing. Not only is he a wonderful painter, but he also is very informed. You can make a reference to something in a David Adler house, he'll know it. Uh -huh. um, and the same with, uh, you know, or something Elsie DeWolf did or something. Yes, he's, you know, he's very knowledgeable in that way. Uh, I, I'm sure you've seen his work all yes, over. Yes, yes. Oh, and he's great. And so, and he always says, if you want Gracie, get Gracie. They're fabulous. But this just has a little more of a sense of humor with the kind of the the big urns in the front and crazy little tents and things. So um, anyway, he he did this and he painted the floors because they're that kind of 1905, you know, thin orangey wood. I don't know how they got that orangey, but you never get it out. So I thought, let's paint it. So that's what we that's did. Serene and beautiful. And, yeah, it it's, and then this was the dining room. Uh, of, of this and it's it makes this sort of enfilade and uh yeah so uh and at the other end of this is a is a large 18th century mirror you know very louis says uh so and it's kind of cloudy because it's the original plate and it it just keeps going on forever so it, it feels like the biggest apartment <laughs> I've ever seen. That painting on the right is uh, Charles Masson. Uh, and on the left are more flower paintings that I have and uh, these wacky little French night tables, which are so good. And, yeah. Uh, and it's yeah. wonderful that they don't match. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. the left side has more room than the right side. I see. I see. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. 
And this is the entrance. And uh, it was kind of a little more open. Right there would have been the stairway up to the other floor. I see. And at one point I had the chance to buy it and I thought, oh my God, do I, do I owe it to architectural history to put these back together? But I, I just didn't have the bandwidth. So uh, here well, we are. Lovely and, as it is. Yeah, and so this is a Gracie wallpaper, uh, the one that they put their beautiful paintings on. But I've just used it, it's, it's squares here with a little bit of the uh, antiquing. And then the uh, cove molding and the ceiling are both done in their pewter uh, uh, tea paper. So it's kind of dull, but nice. And then uh, Bob did this floor. And at first I was like, ah, that I loved it. It was, I think it's based on uh, a marble floor in, in some Venetian church or something, you know, but it's just, it's great. Wonderful. It's really good. And those were uh, two old baguettes uh, lights that my husband's uh, parents, I think, bought on a trip to Europe and had in their house How nice. on East 71st Street. And then I had them in LA and I thought, oh, they need to go back. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, John Roselli mirror that I had uh, kind of silvered. Yeah. Beautiful. It's a, it's a nice entry, you know? Yeah. And this is, this belongs to one of my dearest friends in the world, Courtney Daniels. And uh, it's their house in Hope Sound, which I think we did like 20 years ago. And it was, a, I think a forties house that could just kind of grew and whatever. And we did the painted floors and it was kind of unusual when we did it that we chose the colors of sand and sea and sky rather than the bright colors that a lot of people use there, which is great, but that was not Courtney's style. And uh, it, it's a house where you feel very comfortable going barefoot in shorts in the day and barefoot in silk trousers at night. So. It's really a comfortable house despite or because of, I don't know, you have these old chairs that you can bring up and pull apart and they make all kinds of conversation. And then these great squishy sofas and a place to put your feet in between the books. And uh, so things with antiques and uh, can, can still be really comfortable and very, uh, I think, easy to to move around and so pretty it is a surprise for that area and this is part of their house in uh charlottesville which was an an old farmhouse and this is even i think longer ago than that but uh the rug is hand tufted coir and and yet it's in a traditional kind of pattern and, uh, you know, these are little 19th century slipper chairs, but that you can move around and you can put your feet on if you're in, in those Napoleon Trois tufted chairs. And then the sofa is extra deep. I think this is the second iteration because when we did it, one thing the younger people of the family said, we have to keep that sofa because it's really deep and you can, you know, be so super comfortable with it. Well, I love the ruffle on the ottoman that doesn't go to the floor. And then the little box pleat on those slipper chairs. Yeah, so that ottoman uh, is started life, the original one, as a Napoleon Trois uh, a window seat. And I bought it and I had it when I opened in 1988 in uh, Hollyhock. And uh, the man who, uh, was it Ron who owned uh, uh, well anyway he, he he owned Rose Cumming that's right and he was a lovely man and he came in and I had you know the books that I was selling you know probably four books and stacks there and he wanted it and I thought 
wait a minute, where am I going to put the books? You know, I've, just, I've been a shopkeeper for about, you know, 10 days. And so I quickly had it copied and I've used it a million times. It's so great. I have one right here in my library that's kind of wonky in the middle because I've put too many stacks of books on it. But that was one of my COVID resolutions, you know, to yeah. get it together. But uh, I've done it upholstered in velvet with with bouillon fringe and you know it's just it's a really great thing it's so unique yeah okay annie let's go to the next and this is this is my same dear dear friend who uh is so well read and so well traveled and has her very own style and is afraid of nothing and she wanted theatrical bits, and that's what she got. It's fabulous. It's silk taffeta, and uh, they're really great. And again, Bob did the uh, Bob painted the walls, and we had to put these kind of crazy little uh, uh, closets in there, and he just made them look great. So fun. Um... Oh, this is her bathroom, or as I call it, her boudoir. <laughs> and there's a separate one for her husband. And I have always loved these uh, early 19th century Italian, you know, uh, water urns. And uh, and I was very inspired by Frederic Mechiche and those wonderful things he was doing. So it was definitely the he was the inspiration yeah so and uh, yeah so and uh she loves it it's really special and i've, I've used that in a powder room too and uh that they're, they're great and, and bunny and her uh and her wonderful uh kind of conservatory off her barn she's filled with plants and things that's so oh, she nice nice so pretty yeah and this is the uh, living room for that. I think it was some kind of porch. It's, it has a uh, it has a brick floor, and I mean I don't know, but it was a porch. But it was used as the living room, and uh, and I remember it was so long ago the first time that I had to I ordered the rush matting from the lady in in England who makes it because it was an extra long one and in those days they wanted you to water it with a watering can right. <laughs> uh i don't know but uh and then courtney has the most terrific uh collection of uh painted and non-painted chairs and little settees that she's collected over the years and so many interesting things and she had a collection of um, beautiful paper boxes. And uh, so we did this table in the middle with a, with a, uh, a pretty uh, embroidery on the bottom. And the curtains, uh, which are toning with the walls were left over from a previous, a previous iteration. Interesting. Well, I love this room because as, as formal and as, um decorated as it is it has a modernity to me i don't know there's yeah. something so spare like you just well i like do like to leave room for things to breathe and for them for you to look at you know like that and that. uh just but i'll tell you this is a family that has lots of children lots of grandchildren and lots of friends and it's always filled with people and everybody finds a place to sit. Nobody, I think, feels like they have to be like this, you know. It's, uh, a, it's an exquisite it's, room. It's so and it's very, it's very, very welcoming. That is, a, is uh, our living room for summer. When I used to put the, uh, I put the, Oriental rugs down in the winter, and I I, I took the slipcovers off, and um, 
just like my grandmother did. <laughs> but then one day I decided I didn't want to put the Oriental rug back. And so I kind of left it like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did, I did take the slip covers off. And then when I went to put them back on, this was like so many years later. I, I looked at them myself and I realized, you know, they were getting a little old and whatever. So uh, I now changed them to uh, one of the uh, garden roses of, of fabric that I designed. So I have it on there now, but. It's such uh, a pretty room. Thank you. I love it too. And a lot of it came from my husband's family uh, in New York. The library has more things from my family, but uh, this is this one. Oh, and then straight ahead is that wonderful Chaz Garabedian. And um, I bought it with the last money I thought I would ever make when I was eight and a half months pre pregnant. And it's kind of like a maquette for one of his, uh, his, uh, pieces that he does in uh with with ceramics okay. there's there's one at michael's restaurant and whatever and then you know this is kind of a collage you know with different things he found in a studio and then i just mix it all up the things i like to the left are you can barely see what they are but they are uh dessin habillé so this is things that women did in the 18th century when they would get a, a beautiful engraving or a gouache and then put bits of tinsel and stuff, but it was very elegant. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like making a collage in the third grade, which such I also love. But. Such a beautiful mix. And you're lucky yeah. that your, your mother-in-law had such great taste. Oh my God, she had the best <laughs> taste. You're so really, lovely. I mean, she loved her. The other thing she dubbed was what she called um, uh, Italian directoire. It's kind of not as refined. Like the legs might be a little skinnier, but I love it because it's just slightly quirky, you know, mm -hmm. and, and wonderful. This I did for a client I love, uh, a wonderful Southern lady living in Marin. So this looks down over about three acres down to the bay. <clears throat> and she always had a, a place she called the nest near her kitchen or whatever. She's a needle worker, she loves her garden. So there are all these things in there and she has vomerons. Uh, and so she's in there with her dogs and her needlework and thinking about the garden. And so we decided to do it in a really wonderful way, something that perhaps Sister Parrish would have done or something like that, or maybe early Colfax and Fowler. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, Bob Christian did all of this. And then we collected these beautiful uh, botanical specimens made by Vladimir Konofsky, whose work is exquisite. He does it with porcelain and and metal, so. Yes. All right, I wanna make sure we get to your house in Montecito. Oh, let's talk about this and then let's go uh, Montecito. I just uh, thought this furniture arrangement was so fabulous. Well, again, it's it's looking at at the, first we did the, uh, the, first we did the architecture because this house was so beautiful. This was made from the garage. <laughs> Wow. But this house was it, it, not by me, uh, but the house was a, a subdued 1920s Tuscan or Mediterranean. It, it didn't have a lot of, uh, it was very severe, beautiful volumes. So, and then this room had been a little 70s. And so we kind of, decluttered it and did all of, I did all of the walls uh, in lime wash so that they had a solidity to them, right? And, and then <clears throat> had Keelum rugs made out of sisal for every place. So it had this 
kind of wonderful, I don't know, real authenticity. And then we could put in all kinds of crazy, wonderful, either rustic or fancy Italian things like these beautiful chairs that came from Richard Shapiro. <laughs> and um, you can, I, and I love using things that are a different iteration of an old, like that, yes, there is a, uh, uh, garniture up there on the on the uh, mantelpiece, but it's done by uh, Eve. Oh damn it! I can't think of her name. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm such an admirer of hers. Anyway, she's at Jerry Bland's, and she did this. Oh well, that's it. It'll come. Senior to moment. Me. Uh, yes, and then I found those two water urns over there, those Italian water urns. You can see I have a thing for them. I yeah. saw them maybe two years before this project, and I thought, oh my gosh, I have to find the right place for those. And right on top of those Italian cabinets. And this was for a family that entertains beautifully and have grown children with friends. And, you know, it's just, it's really nice. So really nice. Yeah, it's again so calm. All right, here we are. Your house in this is my getaway. So uh, anyway, I looked for about a year and a half in this place where I knew I wanted to be. And uh, then across my uh, uh, iPad came this house, 1970s, all kind of crawling with all kinds of creepers and different things. And I looked at the floor plan and I realized this was great because it had a terrific view of the mountains. I mean, just so good. And I realized I could open it up, you know, I just sketched it. So I saw it on a Friday. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention I'd had a terrible accident and South Africa and been flown to New York. So I was in the hospital for special surgery, oh completely God. anesthesia adult <laughs> between these major surgeries. I saw it Friday and I bought it Sunday. Wow. And, <laughs> well, you haven't regretted it, right? It's so I have beautiful. never regretted it. And uh, it's really funny because uh, one of my clients up there said, do you, there is some decorator who bought a house sight unseen. Do you, who, do you know who it is? I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. Anyway, I haven't regretted it for one minute. I love the place. I love my neighbors. I love looking at the, uh, at the uh, mountains. And I loved working with uh, Dick Boris and James Sharon, my terrific architects. Uh, they're just, we were on the same page about so much, but then they brought so much to it and keeping it simple and yet beautifully made. That fireplace is the only one we changed. The rest are seventies and it kind of goes with it, but they did that beautiful fireplace and, um, the big banquette. Uh, my husband and I took a trip to, uh, we st I know it's crazy, but we stayed in Venice for 10 days in March before the big onslaught. And um, Hutton Wilkinson said, you, you have to go to the Plaza Mariano Fortuny. So we, we actually went, I think, more than once. And, you know, he has that super banquette in there, all covered with damask and all these gorgeous, dual colors. So I did my version of it, but in these colors. And uh, also I knew I wanted to collect uh, works on paper for this. So uh, to the left, which you can barely see, is that huge drawing by uh, Sarah Graham, the, uh, the Scots woman who uh, I think just, she does the most beautiful giant paintings, but uh, I am a lover of, of drawings. And uh, so she did this, it, this is an epiphyte, a little tiny epiphyte 
blown up and uh, drawn on four pieces of Bhutanese paper. Mm. And then all the other things uh, are pochoirs of drawings that uh, Picasso did in the, I think, in Antibes in like 1946. Oh, and then wow. about 58, he decided to have them reproduced by pochoir method, which you may know, which I didn't know until very no, recently, no. is yeah. super time consuming. It's why you hardly do it anymore these days. And uh, it's very realistic looking. And that, um, beautiful light down there, if you can see it. Mm -hmm. That's Giancarlo Valle, Valle. I hope I pronounced his name correctly because I have so much admiration for his style and taste. And he's a designer and uh, also does this. My daughter and son-in-law took me to a, a show in New York and I saw it, I wanted it and it was way too big. So he kindly downsized it for me. Nice. And that wacky, do you see that wacky kind of screwy Italian light from the seventies that's over yeah. on the right side? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then I have the, the one over on the left, you can see way back there that came from Lynn Morgan, but, uh, and this one came from a wonderful, one of the wonderful dealers uh, here or in, in Montecito and I've gotten a lot of beautiful 70s lighting and thing from her yeah, also. also sculptural. Yeah. Right, we, and, only and, have, we only have a few more minutes. So do you mind? Okay. Me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So even in the hospital, I flipped the master bedroom to here where the guest was because it had views on three sides and it's pretty fantastic to wake up in the morning and look out and see garden and whatever. There's my bathroom back in there. Yes. There it is again. I love it. And it's a wall garden where Nancy Gosley Power did the gardens for me. And she just did a wonderful job. And this one is private with a wall garden. So, so nice. Yes, it's really good. I feel very lucky. Ah, this might be my favorite room. It's where I go in and out of the house. It's my flower room. Right outside is the potting table and uh, you know, keep your uh, garden, your, your garden crocs or whatever chic things you wear. Yeah. Uh, your feet in here and I have all the totes ready to go to the farmer's market or out to hold weeds or whatever. But so I just, sick. I love it. I really do. Oh. This is a favorite room. It was the formal dining room and there was a, a doorway and the right hand wall. And also uh, there would have been a, a wall between us and the, and the princess and the pea mattress. And I knew I didn't want to give formal dinner party. So I made it into a reading room, I closed it up. And, you know, made it, I wanted it to be super comfortable. My two oldest granddaughters are crazy mad readers and the one who's five is really her nose is out of joint because she can't read yet <laughs> but we'll, we'll see um and it's just I cherry-picked all the uh the books in here and it's just really fun to lie down there get a great view of the mountains so you can turn the pillows around and look at the fireplace and those uh plates that are on the 70s fireplace I found at Robert Kime, one of my most favorite men and most favorite places to go and they'd been underwater for like 200 years so the the blue is is pretty much faded off and they have these incrustations so I thought that would be fun there and there's two great 70s lamps and I love the way you do them too that's so so ingenious Oh, thank you. So it's just been so fun. And um, let's see what's next. There's your oh, mountains. Those are my mountains. And that is the garden is my, I wanted to salute to Pete Udolf. I went to Humalo like 12 years ago and I've never gotten over it. 
I've seen <laughs> his film. I, you know, there, it, it, it's, it's not appropriate for me in Los Angeles because <laughs> I don't have land, but I wanted this just little part to be crazy and wild and it looks different at every time of the year. Oh, but it's so wonderful and Nancy did all of this you know she's so good she is really good oh, well that was incredible I have one last question for you um I always like to ask this what's your best advice for a young designer starting out my best advice is to look 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 learn 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 I mean there are so many books out there. For me, I've learned so much just from going to, uh, to, to see paintings and things. Again, if you kind of look, look at it to love it first, of course, but then if something intrigues you, why? Is there something that's larger that you wouldn't normally think of that, but somehow it, it balances something over there? Or, I mean, I love all that. And Go to the villa. I oh my gosh, I I never go any place without going to a house museum. Mm -hmm. And my favorite one in the whole world is the Villa del Balbianello on Lake Como, okay. that belongs to Count Guido Manzoni. I love it because it's it's filled with so many things, and it's super chic, kind of seventies on the bottom, and then at the top has all these capriccios and reverse glass paintings that are just cozy. I haven't been there, so I'm going to put that on the top of my list. Yes. Okay. Yes. I have to go to Lake Como. There's a wonderful show there, like a trade show, believe it or not, in September. It's my first trip after COVID. So I'm going to put that, I'm going to go a day early so I can go. Yeah. So Good. thank you. Good. Well, this is a total treat. I can't thank you enough. Um, what an honor and a privilege and uh, uh, to have you on today. Well, yeah. thank you. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, well, you're something, else. you're something else. You're something else. I'm a huge <laughs> admirer. So thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, thank right. you, Dara. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.